I hope that this will be an evening that you'll remember for, for a long time. Uh, there's something to be said about wisdom that comes from being a godly older man in the church. There is that verse in the Bible that says, aged women ought to teach the younger women. And so the very thing that we did probably, uh, you know, uh, two or three months ago, we did the very same thing because that verse was in the Bible. Well, that was such, had such an impact on the women in the church and their response to it was so great, we thought we need to do that again. So we have those uh, older women, not the same ones that are in there, that are, that are part of a panel just talking to younger women. And, uh, and tonight we're going to do the same thing for the men here in the auditorium. And it's uh, tried to get an interesting mix of individuals. I don't know if it's the right mixture or not. And uh, uh, Novell, I guess it's all right to say you are an older man. And Bill, I hope it's all right for me to say you are an older man. And the man in the middle is an elder man. So I uh, need to understand that. that uh, but uh, uh, I, just, I, I, I just want us to spend the time listening to them. I'll try not to uh, uh, dominate or make too many comments. I just want you to be able to hear them. But do you know these men? How well do you know Novell Brown? And uh, how well do you know uh, Richard? Richard's been a part of this church for 20 years. But uh, how well do you know him? And Bill Inger has been here uh, since um, Noah's Ark was built almost or something. And so, but it is just really great to have these, uh, have these men here. And, and so what I'd like for you to do, um, uh, Noel, we'll start with you. How did you become part of the church? And uh, in answering that, and this is sort of a two-part question, so you've got more than just two minutes to answer it. And, uh, and, 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 and how did you become a part of the church? Did you grow up in the church? It's just, what's your religious background? And then... What individuals have impacted your life? I am really interested in hearing this kind of question because uh, who's impacted your life? And so it, it, I think that'll be a real interest. Novell, we'll just start with you, and then when you finish, just pass the mic over to okay. Richard, and we'll bring it all the way down, okay? It's on already. I hope it's on. Okay. I uh, did not grow up in the church. I was... Uh, a Baptist. I say I was a Baptist. My mom took us to a Baptist church. Okay. So uh, didn't know much about the church, just that the preacher preached too long and hollered too loud, the Baptist church. Uh, so I was a, a non-churcher for years. I got baptized in 64 here. Because of, <laughs> because of the uh, persistence of a preacher that was at 18th Street at the time. He insisted on coming by. I was working on second shift at the time. So I guess it was his lunch time that he would go to lunch. And then before he went back to work, he would come by my house. And insisted on teaching me the Bible, which I knew nothing about and didn't want to know anything about. <laughs> so, but he did. He came by. We always had a pleasant <coughs> conversation. And uh, I would ask him a lot of questions because he's telling me that I'm lost, you know, and I need to, I need to get baptized. One question I asked him, did my grandmother go to heaven after she died? And he says, well, I'll be honest with you. I don't know because uh, I don't have heaven. I do know what the scripture says, and he told me that. He didn't say that she was, didn't go to heaven, but it was implied, because I knew she was not a, a Christian according to the scriptures, and uh, that really got me thinking. So after about three or four more weeks, I says, what does it take to get to, get to heaven? says, well, you must obey the scriptures. And I've told you those. And he says, well, what is it that's so important about me obeying the scriptures? He says, being baptized is where you meet the blood of, of Christ. Other than that, anything short of that, you're just not going to be a Christian. And when you die, you stand a pretty good chance of not going to heaven. So, yeah. 
couple more visits, and I says, okay, it's time. Let's, let's go down and get baptized. He says, well, don't you want just your family to see you get baptized? I says, no, they're not here, so it's time to go. And we went down there, I got baptized. That man's name was Jesse Burson. He's the first, uh, first preacher that I knew in the Church of Christ. And I got baptized, and that's been there ever since. That's great. Now... The person that has been most influential since I've been baptized, of course, Jesse, Jesse Person was one. He was the first one. And uh, I really, really have a great affection for Joe Holland. He tells some terrific stories, and he's, he's impacted my life a lot, my Christian life, since I've been here. Uh, before him was a a person named, uh, what's his name, Patrick, I call him Brother Patrick, I can't, I can't think of his first name right now, but we had a lot of common sense uh, talks, and he's teaching me the scriptures without me really knowing it all the time, and uh, I learned from Brother Joe that it's important that you have, and I'm probably going to say this again, that you have uh, Christian friends. What really impacted me, we used to go to dinner on Fridays, and he said that all of his friends were Christians. He didn't have any friends that were non-Christians. Now, that really, really impacted me because I didn't grow up in the church. <coughs> Most of my friends were non-Christians outside of the church, outside of the, the, the family. Well, all non-Christians, that's all I knew. So uh, that was something that I really had to change and, and come to grips with. Okay, done? I was brought up in the church. Um, both of my parents were members of the church, both of our my dad's parents were members of the church. My mom's parents were not. Um, I was 13, May of 1968, and where we lived at the time, we had just built a, uh, built a new church building. And so on Sunday that we had the very first service in that church building, two friends of mine, Larry and Roy Branch, responded to the invitation and they were baptized. And uh, Larry was my age and Roy was a year older. And so we get home for lunch that day and my dad was sitting at the table and my dad just looks at me and says, you know, you could have been the first person baptized in that church building. Now you can't say that anymore. I said, well, I hadn't thought about it that way. <laughs> and that was kind of the way my dad did things. He kind of took the obtuse angle at, at different things, but I knew what it was that he meant, and I was old enough to know right from wrong, and I had just been putting it off. So the following Wednesday night, I became the third person baptized in that particular uh, church building. And I'd have to say as far as um, men who have impacted my life, my dad was first and foremost. Secondly, he was an elder in the church at that particular time, a man who, or a I'm sorry, a man who was not an elder in the church at that particular time is now. His name is Jerry Mitchell. And um, I would, outside of my dad, I would have to say he's, uh, well, I, I feel like he is my second dad. Uh, tremendous man, strong Christian, been an elder for probably 40 plus years. I was one of the lucky ones, I would say, <clears throat> in that I was born to a Christian family. My uh, mother was a Christian first. She came from Alabama in about 1917, down here in West Palm Beach. My dad came here after World War I, and they met on, in West Palm Beach. And uh, she converted him. He was from Georgia, 
Hard Belt Baptist, and mother converted him. I'm saying this for the simple reason that you young men, when you choose a mate, choose someone that would help you get to heaven. I did. I married Nell. But it was, uh, as I said, my mother was a Christian first. Her dad, my grandfather, was a walking Bible. He can quote the entire Bible to you. He retired from the l &M Railroad, and I seen him at nighttime with a kerosene lantern reading his Bible. In Alabama, we would visit him. And uh, as I said, he was an influence on me to this extent, but no more than what my father was, because Dad was a very good man in a lot of ways. But as everything is relevant, sometimes you may be go the run the, the run the wrong way. But you have come back if you're taught. And I would recommend to these young men, some of us older ones, and I think I'm the oldest one here, 88 years old. You are. <laughs> that some of you young men, if you need help, go to someone older and ask their advice. And don't be ashamed to do it. I have as I got older. And I didn't want to say this for the, because there have been two people that also influenced me. One month, month, maybe someone, Hugh Piper was a preacher here when I came back from overseas. He helped me out a lot. Don't be ashamed to go to someone older. And the other one do it is a man, Faulkner. Brother Faulkner was an elder here. And uh, his son, Dennis and Bill Jr., they ran together. And Paul and Brother Faulkner was an elder. And when I was having some problems with one of my children, I went to see Fred. I said, Fred, what can I do? I've done everything. I don't know what else to do. And he gave me some advice. And it has stuck with me from ever since. If you've done everything you can do, Put it on the shelf and test, say, God, I tried. It's your turn. And that's what you have to do. All right, Novell, we'll let you go first again then. How's that sound? Uh, we're going to be able to cover all these things we've got written down here. Novell. What practical advice would you give to these men tonight who are husbands or who someday will be husbands? What practical advice would you give to fathers? There's really almost a two-part question to this about how to keep your home focused on the right priorities. And it does not necessarily have to be something that you have done I can tell you a whole lot of mistakes better than I can tell you how to do this kind of thing, but if, 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 you, if you were just going to give some advice to those of us who've been married even, you know, multitudes of years, or those who are newlyweds, or those who are not yet married but someday will be married, just what practical advice would you give? And Richard, you can go second, and Bill, you can go third. 
Wives are really wonderful things. The most wonderful thing to happen to a man is to marry, have a wife. The thing that your, your job then becomes to keep her happy. <laughs> That's a job. But it's a pleasant job because when she's happy, things go smoothly in the house. And that's what you want to do. Uh, I find that wives depends pretty much on what you say. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but they listen to you. So you must always say what you mean and be able to say it again because uh, she's going to hold your feet to the fire for that for any statement you make, and which is good. So you, you have to be careful what you do or, and what you say because they, they're watching you, just as your kids are. If you're married and have kids, they watch also and they listen. You can always tell that they'll listen when you do something contrary to what you told them to do, then they'll tell you, Daddy, you said, you know, <laughs> you know so you, you, as long as you can do that, as long as you can be firm in what you say and always be truthful with them in everything that you say, because that will come back to you too. Uh, Oh, uh, what did I have my glasses? What else was there? What is, what's the other question? Oh, children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, young fathers. Your children is a jewel. Uh, they are the jewel from the other jewel that you have. <laughs> and you're, you're to treat them that way Teach them well. Always be a godly presence to them. Steadfast in the things that you do and say to your children. It means a lot to them because they will mimic you. Um, and fathers, I don't know that, that I have been, always been the best father for my kids. I, I spoiled them rotten, but I don't know if that's always the best thing to do. But I've always tried to be steadfast with them. They, they always remind me of the things that I said to them. And if I, we waver just a bit, they'll remind me, which is not, not bad either. It keeps you straight and firm. Teach them that your overall guide is the Bible. God is your steadfast savior. His, God is the person where you get all of your strength from and you try to pass that down to them. My advice. My father-in-law said a while ago in talking about my mother-in-law that he felt like that he was looking to marry someone who would help him go to heaven. They raised their daughter to be exactly that person that I was looking for as well. Um, you know, you can look at when you're when you're 18 or 19 or 20, you can look at your mother-in-law and you can see your wife in X, whatever X is. Um, and what I saw there was a wonderful Christian woman and, and her daughter was just like that. And so, um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that for the years that Debbie and I have been married, um, she's been the strength that I've had 
when I needed strength and I've been the strength that she needed when the situation was reversed. But I can't imagine having a stronger uh, woman at my side to be able to spend the last four decades plus and to raise all of our children and those type of things. So I'm looking most, mostly at you guys right here, right now. Um, when it comes to being a, a father, to being a family, I would also say never, ever lessen the importance of going to worship service. And I, I hate using the word go to church, the term, rather. I don't like that. I've never liked it. It always, it, it's like we were going to a place, not going to engage in an activity. But there is nothing that's more important in keeping our, our faith buoyed from one week to the next week in my opinion, than uh, worship service. There are people who sit over there in my section of the auditorium who edify me simply because they're here. Uh, they don't have to come say anything to me. They don't have to stand up, sit down, do whatever. But because I see Bessie Walker sitting right over there then everything's kind of right with the world. And she lifts me up just knowing that whatever her problems were for that particular day, she put them aside and she was here. And so I can't emphasize enough to not lessen the importance, never do anything that would lessen the importance of a worship service. I would also say never, ever compromise on worldly issues, period. It's the scripture, and that's all there is. Solomon said it twice. There are ways that seem right to a man, and in the end, they lead to death. And that's the world that we live in today. One that does not recognize scriptural authority, that does not recognize that God is the creator, and as a result of that moral relativism, is guiding our society. And that's, that's one of those things that Solomon was talking about that seems right unto man, but is not. And then lastly, I would say, once you guys, you younger guys that don't have a wife and you younger guys that do have a wife and you got smaller kids and so on and so forth, never ever present a divided front in front of your family. Um, Novell was talking about the, you know, spoiling his kids and, and then them pointing out to him how he was one way today and another way another, another day. There is no one smarter in the ways of these things than a teenager. Um, every molecule of hypocrisy that you can possibly have in your life will be pointed out to you in the snap of a finger, the blink of an eye, uh, whatever. Never ever as parents be divided. Go to the scripture. Figure it out. Present a unified front when it comes to family issues and raising your family. I'll tell one story about one of my boys, and I won't tell you which one, because one of them you see every Sunday, and it wasn't him. <laughs> I'll let him off the hook. Um, we had a lot of trouble with our boys wanting to live the way we wanted them to live and do the things we wanted them to do and conduct themselves in such a way that was appropriate for a Christian. And I, you can say boys will be boys, and that's fine. But one day you get to a point where you have to draw a line in the sand and, and you have to deal with it. And so it was about 32 degrees outside. One of the boys had left the house unannounced. We found out about it. And so we went and locked the window that he crawled out of. 
which then forced him to come to the front door to come back inside the house. I also did that once with his truck. I went and took his truck away from some place where it wasn't supposed to be, and he had to walk home and, and fess up to that, too. That was kind of funny. But on this particular night, he came back in, and he just kind of looked at his mom and I, and if it were not for her strength in that particular moment, I don't know that I could have gotten through it by myself. But we marched him right back to the front door, sent him right outside and shut the door behind him because he would not commit to living by the rules that we had there in our house. Any of you guys ever run away from home? Ever been thrown out of the house and not allowed to come back in? Well, it took about three days before he came back. We worried, we fretted. I had enough contacts that I knew that he was okay. But that was the most difficult thing I'd ever done. And if Debbie and I had shown one fraction of an inch of division on that issue, it would not have worked. Period. End of story. I should quit. I can't emphasize enough as far you young men, you older, you lost. <laughs> For the young men, as I said earlier, find a helpmate that would help you get to heaven. I've, Nell and I have been married 65 years, and we have been in business together 50 years of that just about. And people think, can't understand how we can work together but it's compromise. Compromise. So it's important as far as you're concerned. Live this way. And we have three kids. Three kids. We have three adults. And in the growing up, there's one thing they never had to do ask me if we're going to church because they know they're going to church. I took the time with them. Neil took the time with them. And this is very important. Take time to be with your children. We live down on Tropical Drive and we travel all the way up to North Island to church. And you can ask my son back there, Debbie's not here, to ask my son, what did we do on that 30 or 40 minute ride? We had Bible songs, Bible questions. This is important for them to do this. But it's a good life and you do it if you're still with God. I hate to try to stop these folks. Is this powerful? I want to ask you one final question, probably. You've only got about two and a half minutes each, and so what is your favorite verse in the Bible that has helped you the most? or perhaps some song that has helped you, and why? Uh, who's got the mic? You've got two and a half minutes. That favorite verse of mine is uh, not really, not really my favorite, favorite verse, but it is a verse that has helped me in many instances. Uh, since becoming a Christian and dealing with adversity in the family and at work. That's uh, Psalms 37, 7. It says, uh, in part, fret not. 
wait on the Lord. And that, are, uh, that has always helped me through tough times because uh, Bill said it earlier, you do what you can You, you do what you can and then leave it up to the Lord to do the rest. But as I tell my kids all the time, make sure you've done everything you can before it happens. Habakkuk 3.17 is my favorite verse. I have it paraphrased in my head. I'm going to read it right now. It's, it's 17 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He is my strength. He will make my feet like the feet of a deer, and he will make me walk on high hills. There's, there's nothing that is more powerful to me to know that no matter what else is crumbling around me, God is God. That is a hard question. What is my favorite verse? I could really say the Bible is my favorite verse because I can go anywhere in the Bible and I can learn. To pick one out, I just can't do it. One I do like, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I feel no evil, for thou art with me. That's a comforting verse, and that's one of my favorite. And as far as the song, I think every time we sing it, I get a lump in my throat, and that's family. You're my family, and your kids should be your family, your wife your family. Thank you for being the encouragement to me. You can never know what joy and strength that we receive, especially from you younger men, the young adults who sit back here. Just do the ear presence and your devotion to God.